On the, uh, we, we had fun this week with the uh, Friday uh, WordCast. Kathy and I, I came in one day, I said, hey, Kathy, check this out. The, the idea, we're doing Life Sappers, and if there's an elephant in the room if you're talking about things that drain you or just kind of suck the life out of your uh, faith, that type of thing is difficult people. You know, you probably heard that old joke that people say the church would be just wonderful if it wasn't for the people, right? If it wasn't for people. It's all about people. So anyway, we're doing difficult people as a life sapper. And we covered that on Wednesday. So we, uh, in our research, and man, I'll tell you what, there's lots and lots of biblical and clinical material on difficult people. Are you a difficult person? Am I a difficult person? And so we found <clears throat> among in this research something called the difficult person test. And uh, if you go on the media page, you'll find the test there too. So Kathy and I, I said, hey, Kathy, check this out. So we did it each, a very simple test, just a few questions. And you agree, strongly agree, disagree, or strongly disagree with questions they had there. So we said, we tempted faith. First we, or fate here, first we did it on ourselves, and then we turned around and did it on each other <laughs> to see where we would fall. So you'll have, if you want to know, I'm, that's just a shameless plug for, for uh, the webcast if you want to know how it turned out. But the fact of dealing with difficult people, we all have to do it. I don't think there's anyone in this room, if I ask, have you ever dealt with a difficult person or be anybody said, no, never. I doubt it. If I even said, <laughs> yeah, she's pointing at me. There you go. Uh, is, and that's a good point, Pam, is even if I said, have you ever dealt with a difficult person in a church, you would probably all still say yes. And if we were honest, we probably have to say this in all likelihood, Every one of us in here has been the difficult person for someone at some time. Chances are there's somebody out there that say, yeah, you were a difficult person in that situation. So we don't get away from it. it, it it's there. So on the uh, Friday, we covered kind of broader, a little bit uh, biblical parallels, some clinical stuff. And, and that was great. But this morning was really, it was a setup for this morning because this morning is all Bible. And it came down to this question, really. The church starts with 12 men. Were they difficult people? Were they difficult people? As a matter of fact, just to layer on top of that, John 15, 16, 17 says, you did not choose me but I chose you. And this, remember, is being spoken, it's, it's directed towards us, but this is to the, the apostles directly. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Wow. I chose you for a reason, that you would go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide. And that means to say what you do will be so important, it will essentially last forever, for a long time. Eternal consequences. Now let that sink in for a moment as we, we go into the 12 a little bit, is that God didn't just let these people be there. He didn't just accept who came in. He actively chose these 12 people. So there's no question, there's no accident going on here. These people were actively chose by God himself. So were they difficult people? Well, we'll look into it, but if they were, how did it ever end up that they should bear fruit that last? And in fact, did they? Well, let's start with the first question. We know this. We know that most of the apostles were from Galilee. So we're dealing with Galileans. And there's, uh, if we want to know what these ancient Galileans were like, why not look at one of their peers? An ancient Jewish historian by the name of Josephus wrote this about Galileans. He says, 
They were ever fond of innovation and by nature disposed to change and delighted in sedition. They were ever ready to follow the leader and to begin an insurrection. They were quick in temper and given to quarreling, and they were very chivalrous men. The Talmud says that these, this of the Galileans, they were more anxious for honor than gain, quick-tempered, impulsive, emotional, easily roused by an appeal to adventure and loyal to the end. Now, this sounds pretty realistic in a way that there's a whole lot of redeeming qualities mentioned in there, but what's your thought? Were these people easy to get along with? Sounds like even culturally, they, uh, they had a um, disposition to be difficult people. Let's put on personalities on top of that. And, and I actually had come up with four different categories, but for the sake of time, just to take a peek at three. And three categories, because as I looked at each one, you could lump them into a few of these categories. Sometime it would be interesting to turn around and do a full series on all 12 of them in depth, because uh, there's some interesting stuff. We start with scripture, and just as a, I won't call it a disclaimer, I'll call it a qualifier, uh, tradition, uh, history, written after the Bible, a lot of these seems quilt in, but we'll stay mainly on scripture to try and get some snapshots. And the first group I would call the overestimators, the overestimators. And a number of them in the group would fit in here, but we'll use good old Peter, to be our main example. So let's look at some Peter snapshots. Matthew 26, 31. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Now Jesus is trying to get across an important message here. But Peter locks into the idea that they're going to fail him, and, and he answers this way, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fail away, fall away. I will never fall away. Don't you love Jesus' answer? <laughs> he just says, well, as a matter of fact, Peter, I tell you this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. Peter, the leader, he was a natural leader, but he had some serious flaws in there. He had some serious uh, spiritual growth that was yet to take place. But he doesn't seem to realize it, does he here? He's estimated himself as somebody with some real spiritual steel. Nothing will shake him. He's that committed. He's that understanding of the whole situation. But what happens? A little girl, probably no, over, uh, no older than Genesis, <laughs> says, Hey, Peter, weren't you with that Christ? No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. I swear by an oath. No, I wasn't. Reality comes slapping in there, doesn't it? Maybe not all he estimated himself to be. A second snapshot, Matthew 16, 15. Uh, and this is on the good side. This is Jesus says to them, but who do you say that I am? Man, we come in here every Sunday and that's the first question that should be on our mind. Who do we say that he is? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. How would you like Jesus to look you in the eye physically and say, You know what you just thought? That's directly from the Father in heaven. That's, that's quite an affirmation, isn't it? 
Let's go down a few lines. We, we stopped at 17. Let's just bounce just as far down as 21 in the same chapter. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Let that sink in just a little bit. Peter, pebble, took aside Jesus Christ and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said, that is, Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Here's Peter. He goes from a bona fide revelation from God to being called Satan. That's kind of a, an extreme, isn't it? That's quite a change. How did this happen? How did this happen? The two verses fit together. And in the most intricate way. This is what happens is Peter understands something revealed from God that Jesus is the Messiah. He understands that. Here comes the problem. He overestimates what he thinks he understands. He thinks at this point in his walk he's got it all down. He's, he knows the Jewish tradition. He's got it all down. This Jesus we're going to march to Jerusalem. He's going to show them his God stuff. They're going to make him king, and boom, we're in like Flint. He's got it all figured out in his mind. So, Jesus, what are you saying? You're going to go to Jerusalem and you're going to suffer? Nah, it doesn't fit in. You're going to be humiliated by the priests and, and, and all, all the religious professionals there? No, nah, that's, that's, that's not an endorsement. You're going to be killed. How can you be king if you're going to be killed? It doesn't make sense. So, in his mind, Jesus, come on, buddy, let's get aside. <laughs> i got to straighten you out here, master. This can never happen to you. In effect, Peter estimated his own understanding so high that he knew better than God. Aren't you glad that doesn't happen in churches anymore? People think they know better than God. That's being sarcastic, by the way. But how does this turn out? He gets called Satan. Well, obviously, Peter's not Satan, That's, so it's not a literal statement. It's even scarier than that because this man who is committed to the Lord turns out through his overestimation of himself and a lack of understanding becomes the very tool of Satan against what God's doing. If Peter had his way at this time, there would have been no cross. There would be no eternal salvation. There would be no reason for us to be in this building yeah, I would say he was being a hindrance at this point. I would say that he was being a tool of Satan at this point. That's what can happen. Just one thing, and this, this type of overestimation, lack of understanding, happens all the time to this day. And it's very sobering, because it could happen to any of us at any phase of our Christian walk. How does that strike you? That you could come into this place lacking an understanding or, or lacking something in what God's trying to teach you and actually be a tool of Satan coming into this place. It happens. Peter is the first great example for us right there in the church. But here's the comfort. If it should happen to any of us, here's the comfort, how Jesus responds. Because right here, he tells Peter exactly what he needs to hear. He tells him 
Even if it's not sugar-coated, it's just straight up. But he tells him exactly what he needs to hear. Peter, right now, you're being a tool of Satan. Right now, you're standing in the way of God himself doing what God needs to do. Get out of my way. Has God ever said that to you? Hey, get out of my way. Boy, if we would just listen, huh? If we would just listen to this. Second um, difficult type of category among the apostles was this. The hotheads. The hotheads. We'll start with the, uh, the poster boys, James and John, two brothers, known as the Th- Sons of Thunder, nicknamed by Jesus, and I don't think it was always a compliment either. Sons of Thunders. Let's do a snapshot of these guys, Luke 9, 51. When the day drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Okay, that lets us know what was going on there with Peter as well. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. Now, we covered a lot of this in in previous things. We understand the Samaritans had their own temple. The Jewish people, of course, had Jerusalem. Uh, Some centuries before this, the the Jewish people even burnt down the Samaritan temple. So there was some bad blood in between the two. So they didn't like Jews. And if you were a Jew going through their property, and of course, we understand you have Galilee up there, you've got the southern kingdom there, and then there is Samaria right in the middle. So if you wanted to make a straight line, you would go through Samaria. Most people would go all the way around so they didn't have to deal. Jesus said, no, I'm going straight through. And to make it worse, if they knew you were going to the Jewish temple, well, that was just salt in the wound. So that made it even worse. So not surprising then we read this. Um, I'm going to back myself up a little. Who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? So Jesus said, yes, go ahead. It's just seeing if you're reading your scripture. But he turned and he rebuked them. And they went to another village. And and as a matter of fact, depending on uh, which gospel we're in, he tells them, that's not what I'm about. That's not what we're doing here. Well, you know, it hasn't changed since their time. I don't say that we need to go out and offend people just to see what will happen, but... I think we all know it. You want to see what somebody is kind of like really made of is just see how they react when they are offended. Uh, One pastor said people are like sponges. You squeeze them and whatever's inside comes out. And uh, that's kind of what's going on here. These guys are offended. Keep in mind where they are at this time. They're along with Peter. We're going to uh, put in the next monarchy with the Messiah. These rabble, these Samaritans, they're bad enough as it is. Aren't they lucky, beyond lucky, that the Messiah is traveling through their land? And they're going to tell him he can't even come in their village? What? That's offensive. Call on the holy napalm. Bring it down. These guys deserve to get burned. But you got to wonder, is like, how much was... The, any type of righteous indignation in how much was just straight out spite. These guys won't accept what we're all about, burn them down. Just kind of got me thinking on the aside, you know, as, uh, in churches, how many churches in a figurative sense have been burnt to the ground out of spite? People calling down holy fire on each other. Well, that's what's going on here And really, we have to say this, it's coming out of this anger, this passionate anger, 
misplaced, really. Well, why do you say that? Because Jesus did. He rebuked them and said, hey, you guys don't have this down at all. You're not understanding what we're about, so you're getting angry. So the anger would have led to a very, very bad effect. If we have anger, consider this verse, James 1.19. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak slow to anger. And here comes the hook. Are you ready? For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. If we're moved to anger... God says it's not going to work as righteousness. If it's just an event where you tend to get moved to anger, it will not produce the righteousness of God. If your life as a whole, the nature of your life tends to be angry, then the sum effect of your life will not reflect the righteousness of God. Anger is a tough thing. It's hard to control. And it takes you off the rails. It doesn't work the righteousness of God. But these guys weren't the only hotheads. I had to mention one, one more, and, and he'll come up later and you'll see why. Is Judas Thaddeus. He was a zealot. Known by a few names. That we'll start with Judas Thaddeus, one of the twelve. Now, a zealot. Let's just consider that for a moment. A zealot loved Israel, and they hated with equal veracity anything that defiled or betrayed or oppressed Israel. So if in some way you were a violator, they would cut your throat in a heartbeat. They were religious but extremely violent people. Keep that as the background for this verse. John 14, 22. This guy is an apostle, okay? Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Now, on the surface, you might go, Jesus seems to be pulling a riddle here. He's kind of like answering him sideways. What's going on? No, he was answering him direct between the eyes. That, that well. Here is this fellow, this Judas Thaddeus. When he asked why the Lord manifests to them but not to the world, what he's really saying is, Lord, when do we start swinging swords? When do we show the rest of the world who's boss? When are we going to carry out the vision of divine conquest and, and we get to be part of it? And Jesus answers him, love. He answers him uh, just, you know, immediately, when is this going to happen? And Jesus says, if anyone loves me. Nothing to do with swords. When anyone loves me. Well, that's the, the background going on there. And the response, once again, is exactly what that difficult person needed to hear. And that difficult person was an apostle. The third group throwing in here, just call them the smooth operators. And, and uh, the thing with the smooth operators is it always seems to somehow end up gravitated around money. It does in scripture anyway, in, in, in the gospels. Matthew called Levi. Now we are not fond of the IRS as a whole. Now I may end up in jail for saying this, but I'm just being honest. 
There's no one who says, man, I can't wait to pay my taxes. I can't, I wish I would get audited this year so I could, you know, hang out with the guys at IRS. I don't know, maybe Carol's, because she'll learn stuff. I don't. But we have no idea the Judean side of this, because for them, the tax collectors, they loathe them. Not just, you know, nervous, or they loathe them for two reasons. The first was a hatred on religious grounds. Israel felt that every dollar, every penny should go to the kingdom of Israel. It should go into the temple of God. It should go to God's people. So when you have pagans come in and oppress the nation and your dollars are going to go out to people who don't even believe in God, it's a real slap in the face. So if you're one of them collecting money for this, you're not a very popular person. As a matter of fact, you're below the, uh, the, the harlots and the pagans themselves. And the second reason is the corruption. Now, the Romans, they were pretty devious, but they were smart. What they would do is they, these tax collectors, they wouldn't really pay them anything, maybe a very, very small stipend. But they were carte blanche to collect all the tax they wanted. And the idea was, is that Rome said, you know, you need to send us X dollars. But if you collect anything beyond X dollars, it's yours. Well, you get the greedy people in the, uh, uh, in the nation doing this. Of course, greed will take over. It's, well, I'll X and then I'll plus five. No, maybe plus 10, maybe plus 20. And this is the way it went on. So these people were not only giving away their dollars to a pagan nation, they were being fleeced and they knew it at the time and there wasn't a thing they could do about it. Man, did they hate tax collectors. And obviously if you were a tax collector, you had to be a pretty sketchy individual. Jesus chose a tax collector. If that isn't mind-bending, he actively, among the original 12, chose this personality. Pretty incredible. The poster boy for smooth operators, though, has to go to guess who? I hear it. Judas. Judas. Who did you say, Ron? Yeah, Matthew the tax collector. But smooth operator. The poster boy for smooth operator, Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot, son of Kerioth of Judah, the one who sells Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. And uh, we read that in Matthew 26. Uh, but a great mystery has always been, uh, it's been a debate over ages, is if Judas was so quick to sell him out, why the remorse? And it's always been a bit of a problem. Why the remorse? Why? To suicide. What was going on in that situation? And, and people come up with different theories. I thought, you know what? Just to offer a, um, a, a little hypothesis, if you would, what pushed him to that final stage is if you combine uh, the accounts with Judas of John 12, Matthew 26, and John 6, 7, Here's how it kind of goes down, is that uh, this lady buys this expensive perfume. She pours it on his feet. Judas is quite outraged. What a waste of money. Comes back to that. Uh, and of course, he was going to skim, but the fact that money would be spent in this way, because the idea of, a, of uh, pouring a burial sacrifice on Christ, that was way over where his head was. So he was quite put off by the waste going on here, and he thought, well, if we're going to waste money, I'm just going to liquidate my assets, and I'm going to look for a way to betray him and earn some money for myself. Now, that's just kind of a theory, but it's interesting how the two events happened in pretty quick succession there. So it is amazing how smooth operators can somehow use... Um, 
highest language, though. Let's look at the case. Here's the snapshot, John 12, 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, in brackets, he who was about to betray him, said, why was this anointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor. Wow, Judas really had a point. He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having the charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. So what's going on in this situation? It's a, a very flowery line, but what's the motive behind? Well, greed, obviously, if he's skimming from the purse, sounds like a good definition of greed. A certain sense of spiritual cluelessness, if you will, is that he had no idea what this perfume represented, the burial, what, what are they talking about? But nicely wrapped up in, in, in a religious lingo there. But look at the beautiful response Jesus does. It's beautiful. First, he doesn't call him out. He doesn't point out uh, exactly what's going on. That's left for the scripture writing later. He doesn't challenge him on his real motive. Instead, he turns this into a teaching moment. Man, if there was anything I'd love to learn before I finish this ministry is how to turn things into teaching moments. And this is how he does it. First, Jesus defends the woman because... She's doing the right thing. She's carrying out a holy act. As a matter of fact, it's so holy, it's so pro prophetic, really, that most of them don't even understand what's going on. So he defends her as she's doing the right thing, and he explains it out a bit. And then he brings reality into the perspective. He says, poverty is always going to be with you. And when he says this, think of it, the gospel has been spread through poverty. When people have their backs to the wall, they tend to listen to what God has to say for them. That'll always be. Jesus knows that in a very, very short time from this, he's going to be dead. And you're not going to be able to sit and talk with him anymore. He's, this is in the moment. And so he's saying to them, this situation is going to continue to exist but you always won't have this moment. And you say, wow, that's really cool, you know, talking about a physical thing. No, but do you see the implication for us today? Jesus is working somewhere right now, as real as he was sitting with these people. He's doing something. He's doing something in your life. He's doing something in my life. He's doing something here collectively. And he says, are you joining me right now or are you losing yourself to some distraction? He turns the whole thing, as evil as it is, into a teaching moment. But the real mind bender still comes down to this. <laughs> Judas was chosen. It wasn't that he finangled his way in there. God actually chose him to be among these 12. John 6, 70. Jesus answered them. Did I not choose you the twelve? Twelve. And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Now, 
This is where it turns into something for a teaching moment for us. It's not completely literal. I mean, Judas wasn't literally a devil. He wasn't even literally possessed. Everywhere else we read in, well, you know, people who are possessed, they're foaming at the mouth, they're cutting themselves. It's really scary stuff. So what's going on? Well, what's going on here is uh, Judas, as the smooth operator, is carrying out, if I borrowed from Friday's material, he was Machiavellian. You'll have to go, <laughs> go, go there to see what I'm saying. Basically, hidden motive, secret agenda. Luke 22, 3, then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, and of course this is at the Last Supper, who was of the number of the 12. Now, well, as we said, Judas wasn't Satan, he was filled with Satan in the same way that people can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, are you the Holy Spirit? No. Just a, no, you're not. You're, you're a person that is operating as an agent of the Holy Spirit. You're operating as a servant of the Holy Spirit. The same thing is happening here. He is filled with Satan. He has just become the operator or the force or the agent or the servant of Satan while he is among the chosen of God. How did he get there? How did he get there? Product of choice is what I would say is no matter how you look at it, it was one decision after the other. It was one teaching moment after the other where he said, nah, and he chose otherwise. He got himself there, no matter what Satan was going to have him do. Any of us at any time, if we're not careful, can follow a path where we can end up as a tool. So choice is that important. But let me go back to the first question. We were talking about how, and who hasn't fantasized, sitting, seeing the very face of Jesus, hearing his very voice, sitting among those first 12 apostles and listening. Would you still like to be there? Maybe you would. I mean, you know, I can understand it. Me, not so much, because you want to know what? While, while Jesus is on the earth with his 12, it sounds like, a whole bunch of different churches I've been into over the course of 40 plus years. These guys were difficult people. They were difficult people. Well, then we say, if they were so difficult, if they were so flawed, how do we have the church today? How did anything happen? And think about it. Here's, here's where it goes. That's how the church started. That were, the, that were the personalities that were involved in starting. But by the time their ministries ended, they gave birth to churches from Jerusalem to Rome, from northern Greece to the north land of Britain, from southern Persia all the way over to the Far East in India, so basically all of the known world in their time. Peter, who had cowered before a little girl, now spoke openly and converted thousands at a time. Even in Jerusalem, the hot spot. The, remember that guy Judas Thaddeus? Well, you know him by another name, Jude. The book of Jude. This guy who had been a zealot who would cut your throat in a minute went from being a killer of God to teaching this in that short little book that you cannot know God unless you love. That's some switch. Nearly all of them would die for their faith. And what's amazing is that even beyond that, a number of them would request not to be killed like Jesus, not to be buried like Jesus because they weren't worthy of the same death. How's that for a change? So the obvious question becomes, if they started out like that, and they ended like that, how did they get there? How do you go from that to that? How do you make that kind of transformation? 
Well, I'd just like to propose two factors to you and wrap this up. The first deals with choice. The first deals with choice. Not that they loved first, because scripture says God has loved first, but then they chose to respond. How did they respond to the love of God? Well, first off, repeatedly. It's not a one-time event. It's how you walk in life. You get somewhere or you go astray by steps, one after the other. They soaked in the rebukes. They took them seriously. And when they taught something, they may not have understood it at the moment, but it was there. They believed it. They kept it inside themselves. Now, there's where Judas Iscariot comes in because there's the contrast. That's what 11 of them did. One of them did not. And we know how that one ended. And in those things they were told, this brings us to factor two, they were told, don't leave Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He will make you witnesses. And then there was a mighty rushing wind that came where they were. And then Peter got up and converted 3,000 people in a shot. And people were repenting and they were given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Every church is a bunch of difficult people until those people continually choose to join Christ where he is. And that is factor number two, the Holy Spirit. Every church member is a difficult person until they are filled with the Holy Spirit. It starts with a choice and a choice on repentance. But for the, if you use the original 12 as your template, nothing really changes. The match is not lit. Everything you know doesn't come to life until you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Now that doesn't mean you're going to start speaking in tongues necessarily. It doesn't mean you're going to start acting all weird. Doesn't mean a lot of things that we see through charismatic movements per se. But it does mean this, and this is without exception, you will start to transform. You will start taking on the nature of Christ. You will go from being Peter before to Peter after from Judas Thaddeus before to Jude after. These things will happen. And this leads to a closing question. And then I'll stop. That's not true. I'm going to pray after that. But the question is, if this is necessary, I mean, if this gets through, this is, here it is. This is the main point takeaway. This is it. You cannot be transformed into what you can and should be without the Holy Spirit, without God himself coming within. The question is, are you ready for that? Continually, are you ready for that? The last thing I'll do before I stop is I want to pray. Alpha has, Alpha Course has one thing that's spot on the money. I don't know, maybe uh, Ron, you can tell me where it is. Somewhere in there, in the day away or somewhere, there is prayer on how to receive the Holy Spirit. Because it doesn't mean anything if it doesn't take you there. I'm going to pray that for all of us. I, I just want to know this because it's active choice. Who should I be praying for to join in this quest as I pray? I'm praying for every, every and then praying if there wasn't that uh, Lord God move in us in that way too. Heavenly Father, we are here before you. Lord God, we acknowledge we're all difficult people. 
And we acknowledge that uh, if we stay in those carnal ways of ours, we'll just burn everything down. It won't succeed. But Lord God, in that acknowledgement, we know that you offer the Holy Spirit. It was the first thing promised. If we repent and we accept you as Lord, we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Lord God, we're not praying in a way that we expect some strange, weird thing to happen, but simply, Lord God, that we will be in the process of transformation. Lord God, if it's a case we haven't felt your presence, may we feel it even now. If we haven't started to change, may the change start now. And if the change has started, may you make us so hungry for you that we continue, that the choice is always to be filled by you. May one, no one leave this place today without knowing the Spirit of God has actually touched them because that is why we are here. And we ask this in the blessed, in the solid, in the true name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.